I thank you very much for joining us on this wonderful first day of spring. Uh, you're back at another FP webinar. These are our short to the point webinar series that are subject matter that you guys dictate, right? So we're going to, even at the end of this, you'll get a survey. What do you want to hear about? What do you need to know more about? And we'll put together a webinar around that for you. Uh, we're here to educate. So uh, I think we've got about six or seven already online on fbweb.net, so you can always jump on there and see some past webinars. Uh, this one will also be available online when we're finished, and uh, all the attendees will receive it by email later today as well. So uh, today, like the last couple webinars, we're going to be giving away something at the end. So a random winner will be chosen at the end of our Q&A session, or in the middle of it, depending on how long it goes. Uh, to win a Windows 8 Pro. So that's valued at about $199, and we will randomly choose someone who's been with us the whole webinar at the end. Uh, once again, questions, you've got the chat uh, on the GoToWebinar screen in front of you. You can use that to ask us any questions that we'll get to in the Q&A, and you can also jump on Twitter, use hashtag FPWebinar, and uh, we'll be tracking that, so we'll, we'll get to those as well. Today, we are talking about protecting your infrastructure. Uh, we're going to do that by understanding the basics of cloud security. Uh, joining us once again is Mr. President Chris Schwab, and this time he's pulled in our infrastructure manager, Matt Kinder, who uh, is going to prove again today his expertise isn't limited to network security, but also to being a master of the barbecue grill. So for now, let's just focus on security expertise. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Peter, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, you know, the, the first thing I, I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit here was that, you know, these, these webinars, we do keep them pretty short. We try to keep them, you know, within that 30 minute window, which means we'll probably talk for 15, 20 minutes um, and then take another 10 minutes of questions. And the tricky part with that is when you're dealing with kind of a, a weighty topic like uh, security here, there's a lot to get to. So. Uh, we want to sort of run the whole gamut here, which basically means we're going to hit a lot of topics pretty quick. Um, so at the end, if there's anything that that we went through too quickly and you need you know need to ask questions, feel free to do that. And then we also, um, if we if we skipped over something that you wanted to hear, um, you know, let us know that too. The the, the basic structure that we're going to go through today is we're going to talk a little bit about physical security. Um, so, you know, basically how to secure down the actual data center, prevent somebody just from, from walking in and, um, you know, and physically touching that equipment, taking that equipment, accessing it. Um, we're going to then talk a little bit about the network security that, that's, um, that we like to see in place. And then we'll talk a little bit about application um, security on the, on, uh, at the end here. So uh, before I get too far, let's go ahead and get our introductions out of the way. Like Peter mentioned, I'm Chris Schwab. I am the president of fpweb.net. I, um, <clears throat> I, I started here as a technical person, support person, and I've done sales and pre-sales and marketing and, and um, kind of run, run through a, a lot of different positions there. I've talked to a lot of different people about what they're trying to do in the cloud and what their, uh, what their hurdles are and what their security needs are. So I've I've heard a lot of those questions and, and had to find the answers to them. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of given me a perspective of, of what a lot of people uh, are, are looking for and asking. So uh, with me today is Mr. Matt Kinder. Matt, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, y'all. Uh, Matt Kinder. I am the uh, infrastructure manager here. Uh, come from a pretty uh, extensive background in the, in the networking field slash security field. Um, so I've uh, I've definitely lived it um, for uh, a, a quite a long time, and so can speak to most of this uh, um, firsthand. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, Matt's kind of our, our resident go-to person for anything networking, data center, any of that. So that's that's kind of why he's uh, he's been brought in here. And and the first thing I'm going to have Matt talk just a little bit about is. Uh, Physical security. So, Matt, you know, as far as the, um, you know, if you're looking at a data center, you're looking at um, a cloud provider. What type of physical security do you like to see around that data center? Yeah, and, and again, like Chris mentioned, these are pretty broad topics, um, and we're, and we're going to go through these pretty quick. But some of the highlights: um, physical security. It, it's it's one of the uh, 
important aspects of, of, of network security slash securing your assets in, uh, in a data center or a cloud environment. Um, and it, it, it really can go unnoticed and, and maybe should go unnoticed uh, a lot of times, uh, starting from when you, you're pulling your car into the, a parking lot of a facility that you uh, may house some equipment in, um, whether that be a gated, uh, fenced area for uh, parking security, um, all the way we see some of the federal buildings that have gigantic iron pipes that pop up out of the uh, driveway um, if the panic button's hit. Um, a lot of data centers will position gigantic boulders on the outside of the structure to prevent a, a, a car from uh, um, parking slash smashing into the, uh, um, to the building. Um, you know, any of these things uh, could go unnoticed to the, to the naked eye when someone's driving by. Um, of course, video surveillance nowadays um, is top notch. So you can run a, a, the full gamut, um, camera over the entrance door to 100 cameras canvassing every, uh, every area of the outside of a, um, a data center facility. So these things are important, and I think they need to be uh, thought about at a minimum um, when, when talking about security in, in, in general. Um, so once we're in the parking lot or, or towards the building uh, that, that we're talking uh, about, there are, are many different ways to, uh, to get into a facility depending on um, how the, the processes and all of the, uh, the, the rules and standards are followed. Um, Many facilities have uh, have trap doors, so you'll you'll walk through one set of doors, um, be kind of trapped in a hallway until uh, everything is cleared. Then a second set of doors is opened. Um, if anything is uh, awry there, um, you could find yourself, or someone could find themselves locked in uh, um, the entranceway. So small things like this may go unnoticed, but uh, you know, but are important. Um, Moving towards the the data center, you can experience a, a, again a wide variety of of uh, options to secure an asset um, from a, a, a private data center which no one has access to but you. Great, the perimeter doors are uh, secured. Um, from a shared facility, you uh, could experience a cage uh, around your assets which again will, uh, will be another set of locked doors, whether that's key, uh, biometrics, uh, um, it could be a, a key pen or a card, any of the above or all of the above. Um, many facilities will have rows of uh, cabinets, um, structured cabinets with door alarms, locking doors, uh, motion sensors. Um, I've seen cameras inside of a cabinet to uh, see who's standing in front of it um, at face level. So again, these are things that can go unnoticed, but uh, should be should be thought about and referenced when you're when you're making a decision or uh, trying to secure an existing environment. Um, that's kind of the high level on on a few of the um, physical points. Um, Chris, yeah. do you think of anything that I'm missing there? You know, I think the physical security stuff is always interesting to me because we're, we're we're talking about data, right? And and we're, we our minds immediately jump to kind of the next two, which is that network and application. But so the the physical stuff sometimes gets overlooked. And you know, if, if people can have actual physical access to the the data, um, you know, the, the other two aren't nearly as important, right? So we've got to make sure that we've got that that secured. No, and and I agree with Chris. Um, I, I don't have the percentage in front of me, but um, I know for a fact the percentage is high. Most of the, the breaches that, that will will or would happen um, come when someone's standing in front of the equipment. So um, mitigating that, it's important. And uh, just following the rule set. If you have a process in place, it has to be followed every time, um, whether you're 
uh, leaving the facility, running to the truck uh, to get a tool, um, and back in, the, the process is important. So it's, uh, it's executed every time, right? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, let's say we've got this in place, right? We've, uh, we've prevented somebody from uh, accessing this stuff physically. Um, the next step on that is, is trying to kind of secure and, and get the network in shape. So same type of question here. What do you look for that needs to be in place from a network um, standpoint, Matt, to, to kind of prevent or at least slow down access to that data? Right. And, uh yeah, you know, again, it's a humongously broad topic, and we could we could spend hours uh, talking on it. But some high level um, basics. Most of the uh, the security that you're speaking of, uh, whether it's a private data center, cloud data center, or or, or any of the above, um, the traffic's coming from the internet, right? So the public internet is accessing a service or a uh, an asset, whether that's a web page or so on and so forth. So your, your network security clearly has to start at that very edge, uh, the internet edge of the environment. Um, and again, it goes back to processes that are in place, um, starting with uh, the levels of, of patching, whether that's iOS or, or, or um, what, what have you on the edge equipment that is kept uh, bug scrub and, and up to date and following that process and, and that means on every piece of gear and, and everything touching the edge. Um, from there, uh, of course, you always want to follow every industry best practice on um, securing the uh, path from that edge um, to the cluster of firewalls or the next level of uh, communication in the, in the, the chain. Um, I, I think that, you know, again, the process for rule sets um, is some, something we can touch on briefly. Um, the, the rule sets need to involve all parties so you can document, follow the process, and, and not allowing any traffic uh, that is unneeded um, or unwanted, right? So. Um, again, it's a broad uh, topic, but having a finite rule set for exactly the services um, you need at that second uh, layer um, is very important. Um, so the, the firewalls slash IDS, IPS, um, any of that layer of the infrastructure in, in the path getting to your assets um, needs to have the same process followed, um, whether that's a change management or uh, a variety of, of processes that can track, um, making sure that nothing's missed. Um, from there, right, um, we, we kind of pass through, uh, uh, depending on the services, um, segregation of the network, which is very important. Um, having a, a flat network um, can can lead to inherent problems uh, with security, right? So as you're carving this up and in, in, in directing your traffic slash customers um, slash services uh, different directions, again, it's it's important to make sure every step of the way, best practices and your processes are are kept up on. Um, so there's many sandwiches, uh, call them layers, that uh, you're, you're going to have to pass through, you're going to have to maintain, or someone will have to maintain. And uh, keeping track of that is a job in itself. So some of the high level um, to get to your assets, right? Um, and one interesting thing I always kind of go to when we talk about the network stuff is the um, the, the, the logging portion of this, right? Because there's just so much data going through these devices and that logging can be really important, but it's also very um, kind of difficult and, and cumbersome to hold on to. So what do you look for and what do you do as far as, uh, you know, network logging on those devices? Right, and again, a hugely broad topic. Um, every packet that's coming um, from that, that edge I referred to earlier, inbound to an environment, no matter what the environment is, um, you're, you're, you have the ability to log at every step of the way. Um, 
you'll you'll want, in my opinion, to log every packet inbound um, and outbound for that matter. And um, the the amount of raw data that that you can um, accumulate is is massive. So there again are a variety of ways to skin that cat. Um, I, I would. Definitely suggest a, a 24 hour window for uh, live logging. Um, that's from firewalls, from routing equipment, from all of your layer three equipment, IPS, IDS, um, through all of the different strains and layers that your uh, data is going to pass through. And again, the, the logging is, is a job in its own, and there's teams dedicated for it, um, and, and it takes some, uh, some babysitting and, and uh, attention um, and nurturing. So it's important uh, you can keep it for three years or three hours. Most of the breaches or incidents that you will see are going to be found within 12, 24 hours. So um, as a general rule, 24 hours of, of real-time data, uh, you'll usually have uh, what you're looking for in that 24 hours, right? Yeah, and you know, 24 hours it might not sound like a lot if we're talking about, you know, windows and, and through event viewer logs, but that's a ton of data um, to try to save, um, you know, for a, for a provider or even a personal, um, you know, kind of private data center. When we when we're talking about kind of the network security and we transition into the application security, that line it gets a little blurry sometimes because now the applications sort of have to interact with the network um, side of things, and a lot of times you're talking to two different teams. Um, you know, between the network team and an application team, and, and when you when you start sort of transitioning into that application layer security, um, you're you're going to kind of need access to, to both of those teams. And the first one that, that comes up a lot are, are ports. You know, what ports do we actually have open on those um, for those applications? Generally, what we'll have is um, you know specific reasons for for keeping specific ports open. We'll close down everything else just to reduce that surface area, uh, reduce the amount of stuff that we have to actually watch. Um, but I, I think you know one of the interesting things about kind of having ports and kind of managing that is a lot of times your application needs may change um, as time goes on, right? You might not need that FTP server or SMTP not, might not need to be open anymore. And just like we've, we've kind of brought up before here, there needs to be a process to sort of audit those ports as you're going along. Um, just continually checking and knowing which ones are open and which ones you're actually using. Um, the next sort of the layer that, that we like to see in place, it's a pretty basic one, but, but if, if you have externally ac accessible sites, even if they have some sort of uh, permissions behind them, run those things on HTTPS, get a cert, use SSL. Um, it gives us at least a base level uh, of security. It makes it a little harder to um, sort of access that data stream. Um, one that a lot of people don't think about when they're talking about specifically in a cloud model is there the Anytime we have one of these systems and it has a it has a database on the back end, be it SQL or, or some other database, make sure that that database can't be accessible directly from the internet. So generally, we'll have some sort of a web server or something um, that's accessing its data on the other side, and make sure that that there's at least a um, a hoop to jump through to right. get access to that data. And 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 back to the point I made earlier, so segregating these these portions is important, right? Yeah, so if, if we have that SQL segregated off, um, it at least makes it a little more difficult to get to the meat of, of whatever our application or whatever our data is that's, that's kind of hanging out there. Um, another one that I see a lot of people struggle with are user accounts. So, you know, we're starting to adopt this kind of distributed model. There's lots of cloud applications out there. There's a lot of services. Maybe we've got a data center in, in a couple different places. And, um, you know, we, we begin to, to require our users to maintain three, four, five sets of credentials. And sometimes we put the burden on them to try to keep those um, up to date and changed. And, and generally, that's, that's not a good idea from a security standpoint, right? We've usually got pretty stringent controls around our passwords. Um, in our local Active Directory, where they're actually logging into their machines, but what about these other um, applications? You know, maybe it's uh, you know, maybe it's Google Apps, maybe it's Salesforce, any of these that are um, these kind of third-party applications, or even a, a, a hosted solution. What are you doing for those passwords? Are you 
still keeping a, a, the, the same um, stringent requirements around those passwords that they need to be changed? Um, you know, are they getting out of sync? Are your users writing them down on a notepad on their desk because they can't remember everything? Uh, so the, the way to solve that a lot of times is to try to get those user accounts synced, right? So a lot of these services will use Active Directory as kind of their, their back-end user database. And if we can sync those user accounts up, we at least um, kind of put less of a burden on our users to sort of manage their own passwords. So um, we can do things like a trust. We can, we can trust a, an Active Directory from a remote Active Directory. That's what we do a lot when we um, are, are implementing these systems. Uh, the nice thing about that is it's not a copy of the user account. It's actually referring to that original um, user account database for, uh, for authentication. Um, Active Directory Federated Services is another way to do pretty much the same thing, just through a web service. Um, so, you, so you get a, a federated uh, user account, and you, you can end up rolling stuff up. I think, uh, you know, even uh, Office 365, SharePoint Online, you can do federated services there so you don't have any kind of discrepancies in your user accounts. Um, and then, really, the, the, the last one, and it's, it's a pretty basic one, but a lot of times when we start talking about remote servers, we lose sight of making sure that we have some sort of software on those servers to make sure that uh, we are we're scanning for viruses, malware, things like that. Because it's kind of that out of sight, out of mind. If it's not in if it's not in your data center and it's somewhere else, you assume that um, it's fine and it's not been breached. But if we, a lot of times we're actually accessing those servers uh, less frequent, so any hint of something getting on them would be um, tougher to find. So make sure that you have something that's scanning and monitoring and alerting you that there may be something questionable that's, that's on those servers. Uh, so we're, we're running right about our time right now. So just to kind of recap, you know, we, we've gone through, we've talked about some physical security that, that you can look for and look out for, um, network security, we've talked about application security and, and how sort of the, the line blurred, the um, between that and, and the network side of this. Um, one important theme here, though, is to have a process for auditing this and making sure that this stuff stays in place and audit that process uh, on some sort of reoccurring basis. Um, and then ask questions, right? That's kind, of the, that's, that's kind of the overall goal of this is we need to learn just enough that we know what questions to ask and what information to go actually research and, and seek out ourselves. And Peter, I think we have a few people that have sent us in some questions here uh, in regards to this as well. Yeah, we sure do. And uh, yeah, again, <laughs> we're going to hit the Q&A side now. So if you have any questions, feel free to send those in. Uh, Twitter, it's hashtag FBWebinar. And on the GoToWebinar screen, it's in the chat there. So uh, you can hit us up now. I've got a question. We'll start off with, it asks, for a high security setup, what network devices need to be set up in front of the servers? I'm giving that one to Matt here. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, it's it, again, it's a pretty pretty broad question, but um, anything that would be considered high security, in my opinion, um, should traverse several layers of security, clusters of firewalls, and and protection systems on both sides, almost like a sandwich. Um, so we're, we're really truly protecting what source and what destination on XYZ TCP UDP port um, is needed slash logged slash allowed or denied. Um, so the, the key is really um, starting at the outside and, and having several layers uh, that need to be traversed um, to avoid uh, any any misrepresentation of a uh, packet, um, you're you're really truly having to hop through a, a couple different hoops to make it to your destination, right? All right. Uh, got a question from Roger. He asks, how do you prevent cross-site scripting and SQL injection attacks against a web application? So, uh, in, in my opinion, um, you know. Preventing is a, is a pretty solid word, right? Um, what your your goal is is to identify. Um, at, at the point where you identify, you can stop anything um, because you truly have the the, the source or, or destination. And 
um, many of the appliances slash services that are out there now um, are, are very, very good at patterning. And, and as a pattern arises and, and is um, identified, that's the key to success on a lot of this uh, um, application security, um, all the way up through any of the, the OSI levels. So um, identifying that with software slash hardware appliances um, and, and actually seeing that, that pattern um, before it's detrimental uh, is, is the key. And um, like anything, there are some very advanced technologies out there, and it's an ongoing battle back and forth um, between protecting and, and breaching. So hopefully that uh, gives you a, a, a brief answer on that. And when we talk about preventing, too, um, you know, one, one way to prevent this is to make, you know, your target just hard enough that they want to hit something that's a little easier, right? So if we can put some of this stuff in place and we can put enough speed bumps in, um, in place to make it just difficult enough um, to not make you a um, an easy target, uh, you know that's kind of that that's kind of the first step in my mind. Agreed. Agreed. And moving from preventing to protecting, Stan's asking, can you protect unstructured data? I mean, yes, you can protect everything because a data stream is, is always going to have a source and a, and a destination. Um, this is basic la uh, layer three stuff. And that's where the meat and potatoes really, in my opinion, lay. And, and above layer three all the way through the model, again, there are very custom uh, uh, attacks and very custom defense on, on every one of those upper layers of the, of the OSI. Uh, in my opinion, layer three is where your, your meat and potatoes are going to be, and that's where you're going to identify and also stop slash prevent any, any of these types uh, of attempts, right? All right. Uh, another question, what do you do for DDoS protection? And actually, go ahead and explain DDoS. Yeah, so DDoS is, is an animal of its own. Um, you know, there, again, there are groups that that are solely focused on this and, and protecting slash identifying this. Um, high level DDoS is a group of uh, computers or assets out in the world that um, through some algorithms join together to pinpoint and uh, address an attack at a, at a single entity or, or multiple entities. Um, basically taking the horsepower of 100, 1,000 um, machines slash assets and targeting one uh, uh, one specific target or group of targets. Um, again, the key to me is uh, having appliances slash services that are um, constantly pattern updated um, and, and identifying this at an, at an early stage. Um, you see a thousand uh, TCP slash UDP requests at a, at a single destination, that immediately should red flag on any appliance or software service out there. And um, what you do at that point is kind of up to you a bit, whether we uh, immediately um, take evasive action um, through the, the, the software slash hardware itself and shut down that traffic or send alerts or um, you know, there's quarantine, there's uh, redirects, uh, there's a variety of ways to, uh, uh, to handle it, but it's a real animal, and um, many enterprises uh, fight with it daily, and um, kind of goes back to, to what Chris said a, a bit on, um, as you're a bigger target, um, you're, you're a bigger risk, and, and, and you're going to put some more cycles into uh, identifying that or, or preventing it, right? And, uh, you know, I guess I've always seen these measured kind of in two ways, right? We've got the total bandwidth that gets consumed on one of these attacks, and then we have the total requests that are kind of being made on, on these as well. And um, they're, they're two different animals for us to deal with. You know, we have to have enough bandwidth to survive that attack, and, you know, maybe we can handle that through a third party or upstream, and then we have to have um, the equipment that can handle the requests without failing over or airing out. Um, so, this, there's a lot of services out there. There's a lot of service providers that are actually offering that service as a part of 
um, you know, offering you a circuit, you can actually add some kind of a DDoS detection on top of that. And usually they're just partnering with some sort of a third party as well to sort of absorb some of that attack so that we don't feel it as much. Agreed. Well, thank you very much, guys. I think that's all the questions that I see. If you guys think of, uh, you guys listening, if you think of anything else, uh, you know, there's no time limit. Always hit us up if you have a question. We'll be happy to help you out in any way we can. Uh, in the meantime, let's make the day a little bit better for Amber Schumate, who has an awesome last name that I hope I said right, uh, because you won the Windows 8 Pro, and uh, Brianna will be getting in touch with you in a little bit to uh, figure out where to send that to. So congratulations again. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our presenters, Chris and Matt. Uh, 